I've had a lot of interesting experiences here in the Netherlands. And, um, you know, for instance, that I talk about like what it's like within corporate, I even refer to it as the corporate plantation in the sense that plantation and mm-hmm. MSNC replicated in there. But the thing is like, yeah. it, of course, it, it doesn't start, this doesn't start in corporate. Like uh, I'm in corporate now as an adult, but also growing up, there were a lot of things that, yeah, that I've experienced. Hi, my name is Orlando and you're listening to Cooking Back to Our Roots with my mom, Vivian Aqua, the DEI consultant at Amplify DEI. My mom will be talking to different guest speakers from the African diaspora in the Netherlands. The podcast is not just about food, but also about connecting the conversation with our roots and cultivating a deeper appreciation for our shared heritage. Welcome to Cooking Back to Our Roots podcast, Michael. And I'm curious about who you are, what you do. Do you mind sharing that with the audience? Uh, No problem. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, I'm glad to participate uh, in uh, this uh, second uh, series of your show. Uh, So who I am, I'm Michael Goodenhout. I work in data and AI. and basically what it means, like I build data and AI solutions, the technical aspect of it, but also I'm really focused on like uh, on building like standards and policies around the, the use of the technology. So that's also things used in a responsible manner. Um, I've worked for a long time at the Policy Research Institute in the Netherlands. And after that, I joined uh, an international consulting firm, uh, but all throughout wherever I worked, uh, the focus has always been on data and research, analytics, AI, that's really what I, uh, yeah enjoy the working on and uh, that's what I'll keep my focus on. Um, and I think one thing that also sets me apart in, in the way that I work is that even though I work in technology, I really very much have focus on uh, yeah, technology and society and history and also mm-hmm. ethical aspects. Mm-hmm. So it's not yeah. only looking at technology from the technological side, but also really looking for more societal and historical aspects. Um, so that's... Uh, a bit in a nutshell, what I do, I also like to talk about these big matters uh, because it is, when you just look at society, there are a lot of things going on uh, and it also then gets reflected in technology. And that's why I also believe that's very important to, to have that holistic view when you approach technology to also in, like incorporate all those other aspects. Um, so that's a bit in short who I am. Um, I live in Amsterdam, born and raised also in Amsterdam. And uh, I have a background uh, in Suriname and I'm... Of course, mm-hmm. we'll be talking about that more, but that's just in short who I am. Mm-hmm. I want to expand on what you share because I, I see you active on LinkedIn and see you active in the ethics d- domain, but also in the so- uh, social domain, social justice domain. And mm-hmm. why do you believe that we need to uh, fight the fight when it comes to uh, digital ethics and also the social justice part. I know that we had a conversation for but yeah. for the people who don't know you yet and uh, want to learn more about what you do. Can you help them understand why this elements, these elements are important? Yeah, yeah. Like for me, like um, for me, it really has to do with like humanity and like how you look at other people, uh, regardless like who they are where they come from, how they look like, um, the whole idea that some groups of people are supposedly better or higher in the hierarchy than others. Uh, I think that's, that's very damaging. And it's also, to me, it really does not make sense. Uh, mm-hmm. um, there's a Tony Morrison wrote, Tony Morrison, she spoke about the fact like, uh, if you can only feel tall when somebody else is on their knees, then you have a very serious problem. Mm. And that's also why I find this very important because like there are a lot of people that act as if they are at the top of the mountain if they are, that they are better than others. But the reality is like, if you can only be at that position by undermining other people, by tearing them down, then it actually means that you have a very serious problem. Because if you're really healthy yourself and feeling good about yourself, then you don't need to tear others down. They actually would thrive and be happy in a situation where everyone is able to be themselves and shine. Um, so I think it's 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 very important, like apart from the technical aspect, because you know, working technology, but, but the reason that, for instance, ethics and bias and all these types of things are an issue in technology is because they are an issue in society, and it then just gets reflected in technology. Yeah. So some people they they act surprised when there's an issue with technology or advice in there, but I'm not surprised because, like, yeah, I know history, I know society. Uh, 
I know my own experiences, a lot of family experience, family history. So I very much know the society that we live in, all the dynamics, uh, the history of colonialism that is still present to this day, the history of slavery. Um, so that's why it is important because like, because those things have not been addressed in society uh, as, and as a result of the fact that they have not been addressed in society, they then get reflected in technology. Uh, so that's why it's very important. Like uh, if you don't address things, the, the toxicity will just continue. And that's why it's very important to address these matters. Thank you for providing that explanation. And you did mention something about your roots, but I also ask those people who disclose their roots, I ask them, what are the elements that you wouldn't find in Lonely Planet, for instance, when it comes to Suriname? Sorry, did you repeat what, what I wouldn't find in what? So... What are the elements that people would find in Suriname that you wouldn't find in the Lonely Planet, in the Lonely Planet uh, travel guide? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes. Um, well, well, like I said, like, I, even though I was born in Russia, but like when I just look at Surinamese culture, um, I think mm -hmm. when you are Surinamese, when you compare that to maybe how people from the outside look at it, they maybe look at it like as if it's just one place or one culture, but it's actually, it's, it's, it is very diverse. Uh, when you look at, yeah, the whole makeup of the country, like there are a lot of different uh, cultural groups there. Um, and that together is the Suriname that we see now, but it's very much uh, a creation of a history that, yeah, is uh, it's a lot of forced movements and uh, migrations of people. Uh, so like the, that's something that is maybe important to recognize, like the way that you look at these countries in the Caribbean or South America. Um, yeah, they did not just come to be the way that they are right now. Like we, we grow up in a world mm -hmm. and we like, okay, this is the world. These are the, the countries. But the reality is like, yeah, when we look at my own ancestors, like, that's not even forced migration. That's like they were enslaved. That's how they got there. So the whole makeup of these countries, like that it is all a result of colonialism. Um, it's not that this is how the world is or how the world was or how the world is supposed to be. It's like, like this is also a result of that fact. So also when you look at other countries such as Canada and America, like nice countries, whatever, but their makeup is not... How it was a, not a natural state that it is the way that it is mm -hmm. uh, right now. And also, so for Suriname, like it's not a natural state. And yeah, that's something you probably won't find in no travel guide, but that is the reality of how, uh, of a country such as Suriname. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And why did you say yes to the interview on, uh, why did, no, why did you say yes for the interview for the Cooking Back to Our Roots podcast? Yes. Um, also interesting because uh, I remember that uh, I once found the first season on the internet and I remember mm -hmm. reaching out to you back then that, mm -hmm. that I really liked that. Uh, and, but that was long before uh, there was any uh, plan yet or resources yet for mm -hmm. any second season, but just, yeah, I liked it. And I, I shared it with you because I like how you connected um, the different uh, peoples from the African diaspora to each other mm -hmm. through Mm -hmm. uh, to food, to looking at it, and then also looking through food, like to the history of like how the dishes uh, came to be that the way, way uh, that they are right now, because that shows also a lot of our history of where we came from, and also how we needed to adapt in new uh, places to, yeah, still be able to 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 make food that still uh, basically is part of our heritage, but that, yeah, to to be able to survive in that new environment, you might need to change some things, like the way you prepare the dishes might need it to be a little different or some of the ingredients you might need to change because if they were not available, you might need to get something else in there. But it was a, a good show for me to really see like, okay, it's part of a cultural heritage, part of our uh, connectedness and as black people, as African people all over the world. So that's what I really like about the show. And of course, now like you asked me, I find also important to support each other as black people. Um, so that's basically for me a reason to participate uh, now. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Michael. And what is your favorite meal that you want to share with the people? Yeah, yeah, of course. So uh, the, my favorite Surinamese dish, uh, Afro-Surinamese mm -hmm. dish, to be precise, is uh, what we call heri-heri. 
in uh, Surinamese. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically that dish contains uh, uh, yeah, elements such as uh, cassava, uh, sweet potatoes, those kind of elements, yams. So basically like those, uh, in Dutch we call them aardvruchten, basically like uh, mm -hmm. what you indeed get from the ground. Um, mm -hmm. And I like it particularly with uh, the different ways to make it, but I really like it with, uh, with with fish. So there are different fish that we people in Suriname eat. So uh, I know the, how, how we call them in Suriname. So you have fishes such as with, with witty, we call them, uh, red snapper, bam bang. Those mm -hmm. are some of the fish that we then uh, prepare with that meal. But uh, I, yeah, that's that's a meal that I really like because it's, uh, like I said, Suriname, you have diff very, a lot of different cult cultural groups there. But this is a dish that's really tied to the Afro Surinamese part that I am part of. And uh, that's why I really, really also appreciate this dish. And um, what's your number two? Uh, the number two that I have was, uh, uh, yeah, in Dutch we call it uh, uh, pastai. Uh, strictly mm -hmm. pastai. Pastry. And in English, yeah. the, the, the translation is not the best that I like, but you could call it the chicken pie. But I think chicken pie that doesn't mm -hmm. really cover the full load of what actually goes into all of it. Uh, but that's also a dish that I really like because it's uh, something that faces like my mother. She uh, makes uh, for me mm -hmm. and also for my other siblings uh, that a dish that there's a lot of uh, yeah intricacies in there to 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 get it done. So like if someone prepares that like the full way, uh, that also like there's a lot of love, a lot of energy that's put into that. So that's uh, yeah also uh, one of my cherished dishes. Yes, thank you. And, and number three? Number three, that was uh, your peanut soup, you could call it. And that's, uh, mm -hmm. I know that's also in other parts of the African diaspora. You also have that. But uh, uh, yeah, like, actually, I don't really like soup. So the fact that soup is still on my list, that really also shows that I uh, do really like this one. Uh, particularly also the way that we make it. Uh, is we make, uh, we take those plantains, uh, so the plantains, I didn't mention in the area, but plantains we also use mm -hmm. in, in there. Uh, but also like in the peanut soup, we make like little balls. You could call them noodles like but little balls. We then also have with the peanut soup that are made based on those plantains. Uh, so that's also like one of the dishes that I really like. Thank you. And what did you learn from watching one of the episodes of Cooking Back to Our Roots season two? What is the element that you want to highlight? Yeah, um, I thought of course one of the, the episodes was specifically focused on Suriname also, and uh, there was a lot mm -hmm. in there that I, that resonated with me. But uh, I think one element that I think that was uh, was for, it's called, called cooking back to your roots, and then also the question is okay, where are your roots? But yeah, it's it's not only like where are your roots, but like where do you feel rooted? Like uh, mm, yeah, I think that also like. Yeah, because like I can say like where are my roots? I could say like okay, I'm born and raised here. But later on, I will talk also more about it. But like the fact that I'm born and raised here doesn't necessarily mean that <laughs> I feel that rooted here. Uh, but also when I look at mm -hmm. where are my roots, then I could say Suriname. Uh, but yeah, like mm -hmm. I said, like my ancestors also they did not go there voluntarily, and also the experiences that they had there were not very great. Um, so yeah, where do you feel rooted? We, we are very much. I've always been aware of the fact that we are African, but at the same time, we have mm -hmm. very much cut off from Africa. So where, yeah, that's also the fact, like, where are my roots? Like, I feel Pan-African, I feel African. Uh, I feel very much connected to Black culture and people, Black people with a Pan-African mindset, where I find them here in Suriname, in America, or other places of the world. Um, but it then also shows you that I'm very much more, I'm connected to, to my people. <laughs> wherever they are, mm -hmm. but when it comes to like rootedness to a place or a country, that is difficult because we have a lot of, uh, yeah, there's a lot of trauma, not only trauma in the experience that we have, but also the trauma of being ripped from the places where you actually live because we are ripped from yeah. uh, Africa. Then in Suriname, we had traumatic experiences there. And now again, we went from Suriname to uh, the Netherlands. Some of us also in America. There's again, a lot that you then leave behind because your family here, but your family there that you also leave behind. And there's so, yeah, there's a lot of uh, changes and transitions in there. It also makes it difficult to say, like, okay, uh, 
yeah, where are our roots and particularly like, where do you feel rooted? So uh, that's an element that's also resonated with me. Um, so yeah, yeah. And what else caught your attention? Um, another thing is that, uh, I think also really liked, uh, your guest Hillary, who I've also, uh, mm-hmm. uh no, I should also met her through LinkedIn. I also met her last year in person for one time. Uh, but also one thing that she mentions is that, uh, and I, I understand where that point comes from, like, uh, the way that we also as black people, uh, interact with each other. that's important to, uh, not only important to support each other, but also important to, to not tear each other down, uh, mm. treat each other with a proper yeah. level of respect, even if you might not agree with everything, um, because that's also, <laughs> it is, um, the two ways to look at it, of course, it is a remnant indeed also of the, the past, uh, the colonial mindset, all that, that has, uh, cost for us, but at the same time, also you need to say like, okay, at one point you also need to reflect on your own self, your own behaviors and yourself the question like, okay, is it really a healthy behavior to continue to treat each other like that when you know if someone would do it to you, you would not like it. Then you also need to question, like, okay, why they, would you then do it to another if you also know yourself that it would be hurtful? And also, like, if you realize that for us as people, it is actually detrimental. Um, so I think that was also an important thing that for her to highlight that aspect because I realize and I also see, like, okay, how damaging that can be. And also, so like, how it can be like an extra hit because, uh, like, you know me, I just keep it real. I just tell it how it is. Like, when mm-hmm. you encounter racism from white people, that is hurtful. It's it's a hit. But at the same time, based on history, like, I w- I'm not going to say that I have high expectations of that other group because, like, I know how they have treated us, how they have continued to treat us. But when you then get treated badly by people that actually look like you, that have the same skin color as you, that are also American diaspora, that hit can come harder because it's like, wow, you, you're getting, getting it from your own people. So that's also an element that plays into that, why it's, yeah, it was important, I think, for her to highlight it in that episode. And I also, yeah, why it also resonates with me, because I see, like, uh, the the extra pain that that causes, and especially if you would not expect it. But, of course, we've been around longer, so, like, I know how mm-hmm. things go, and that uh, also that then does not no longer surprise me. But still, it is, it's a hurtful thing to experience. So I think it's important for us as black people then also to realize, like, uh, yeah, in a world in which there is a lot of anti-blackness, in which we are treated with a lot of harshness, then um, to also be mindful of the fact that the way that we didn't interact with each other, that does not have to reflect that harshness. Uh, we can have a softer touch, realizing all the things that we all go through um, because it's, uh, yeah, that, that's that's the reality of that world we live in. But uh, yeah, be mindful of that fact. Definitely. And one final question. What else did you notice from the conversation? Um, well, one thing I know is, well, that's maybe more because I, I, I saw the, mm-hmm. the whole first season, of course, and uh, I saw how you mm-hmm. did things there. And I, what I like to hear is that, uh, I remember in the first season, like not so, sometimes you all said two guests, but there was other times that you only had one guest. But I like the fact that you have two guests now in at least the episode that I saw, because of course you can then also, mm-hmm. uh, they can feed off each other, like they can respond to yeah. one thing that the other test and re- that, something that might resonate with the one and that might trigger something else in the other. So I also really, I, I really like that aspect also in it because, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, we, we can learn from each other's stories and that was also already there. You could see like they both came with their stories and you also could add to that, uh, or resonate with certain things that they say. So that's also something that, uh, I did notice having seen the first series also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was an intentional thing that I wanted to be able to capture, different stories because not just because you are from Suriname and I'm from Ghana that we have similar stories, but sometimes we do have similar stories and sometimes we don't. And I wanted to make sure that um, interviewing people who are high potentials, who are not part of the dance scene or the creative scene or what kind of scene to make, to help other people understand that we are also excelling in other uh, career factors or career niches as well. Yeah. And when you look at your past, how do you look yeah. upon that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, a very good question. 
Um, mm-hmm. well, like I said, like I, I was born and raised here, and uh, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of interesting experiences here in the Netherlands. And um, you know, for instance, that I talk about like what it's like within corporate. I even refer to it as the corporate plantation in the sense that plantation and mm-hmm. MSNC replicated in there. But the thing is, like, it, of course, it, it doesn't start. This doesn't start in corporate. Like, uh, I'm in corporate now as an adult, but also growing up, there were a lot of things that, uh, yeah, that I've experienced. So, what I would to answer this question, I would like to just give some of examples to highlight some of the mm-hmm. dynamics that I've encountered um, and yeah. how they tie together. So, for instance, like when I go back to my days in primary school. Um, I've told, told this story to some people. Like I said, like uh, when I w- uh, when I finished primary school, I told people like I was the best student of the class. I was actually by far the best student of the class in primary school. But I told people like I don't tell that to brag, but I tell them like my primary school was actually connected to my kindergarten. It's the same mm. school. Um, and what happened is when I was in kindergarten, my teacher, my uh, white duck teacher, it was a white woman. She actually wanted to keep me in kindergarten a year longer because in her mind, black children do not speak Dutch, do not master the language. And it's ridiculous for various reasons, but it's also ridiculous for the fact that I am of Surinamese heritage. And in Suriname, we were forced to adopt Dutch as our language. But this is how she she looked at black children. And the thing is, my, my mother found out from another Surinamese mother her, her daughter was also in the same class. So probably they wanted to keep her there also a year longer. But when my mother heard that she went to the school and she said like, this is not going to happen. And it did not happen. But then think about that fact, because that kindergarten is attached to the same primary school. Like I said, I left primary school. I was by far the best student, but I could have easily lost a year because that white teacher, like the way that she looked at us, yeah. it's like she, she wanted to keep it there a year longer. So that's also when we talk about institutionalized racism, like how it manifest, it manifests mm-hmm. in many different ways and it starts early because this shows you that the way that white teachers looks at little kids, four or five year old black kids, because you're black, they think like you're incompetent, you can master the language. And it's so fascinating because people all the time, they say like, okay, we don't see color, but they very much see, see color. That's all they see. And uh, this is a story that, uh, yeah, that really it's into because this is then in kindergarten, but I've seen it also in high school. There were instances with mm-hmm. blatantly racist teachers. Um, this one teacher that was, uh, <laughs> she was, at one point she floated a, a racist theory also again about language. And she wanted to like, not that we were talking about that, but she wanted to try to provoke, try to see like, okay, maybe if people would bite, well, we did not bite, but she was, she just floated that racist idea about people with the foreign heritage and how they would not be able to master the Dutch language. That same teacher also, one time she started the class telling a story. Uh, She's reading from a book for no reason. And in that book, the story was a white man sitting in a restaurant looking at the black man. And then that white man started to talk about the physical characteristics of that black person. And I knew very well why she did that, because it had nothing to do with actual class. But again, that was a reason for her to try to provoke and ready to like be racist without actually saying it directly to you. Um, but the mm-hmm. thing is like, these are then our teachers. And that's why it's also like, when you think about black or brown children being taught by white teachers, like <laughs> that's something that you need to be very careful with. And we, of course, we are born and raised in the Netherlands, so we are confronted with that. But in the Netherlands, like they are not honest about such thing as racism. A lot of people are not mm-hmm. honest about it. So they don't address it. So they don't work on themselves. But they didn't get these kinds of things. Teachers saying racist things. Teachers thinking, like, okay, let's hold them back a year longer because, like, yeah, they're black, so they don't mess with the language or they are not smart or whatever. Um, but this is then, like, how you didn't grow up. So, like, when you look at how I look back at my past, like, these are very bad experiences. And when I for instance, talk to other people about it, for instance, when I talk about kindergarten, uh, because I only learned that later that it happened. So I was shocked. But I was like, okay, maybe it's just me. But almost everyone that I talk about to it in the Netherlands has had, with a, uh, uh, a, let me say like a non-white background, has had similar experiences. And then mm-hmm. I was also, I was also like, wow, I tell it to a Moroccan lady that I work with. They did it to her too. 
I talked to another Moroccan lady that I also uh, got to know through work. She they also did that to her. Um, I talked to an American friend. She had a similar experience, not in the Netherlands, but in America, with people also doing her children that way, which led to her even like homeschooling her children. A lot of people do that in America, also black people. That's like, it's so toxic that they're like, you better homeschool them than send them to such a such a racist, toxic school. But that also really shows like how, how at such a young age, this damage to us as black people starts. Uh, and I think mm-hmm. it's important to highlight that because like when I say like, I, even though I talk a lot about what I got in the workplace, I can also talk about that more. But this shows like how early it actually starts. And Definitely. this is something that really needs to be acknowledged and addressed because like you damage children. I can say like, okay, I'm a grown ass man now. Uh, I have certain skills, certain networks that make it easier to cope with these things. But I was also a kid back then, like when I'm four or five years old, yeah, then I don't have that development yet. It's not the, school, the skills yet necessarily to, to, to deal with all these things. Uh, but we as children, we get damaged by these things because that's real, like this is trauma that they're trying to flip on us. So, yeah, that is. You're lucky that your your mother, you're lucky that your you're mother stood up against the teacher and said something because there are some situations yeah. and even here in Amsterdam, elsewhere in Amsterdam, yeah. where the teachers see the uh, the parents see the teachers as authority figures. Well, they must be right. Then you're, you're you are staying in another class another year, and what that does to your confidence, but also at a later age, it's holding you back. There are so many so many people from from an ethnic different uh, background that are being held back. Whether it's kindergarten, whether it's school, whether it's in college, it happens too often. Exactly. And that, that's what I mean. Like, because when I told it to one of my uh, a former colleague now also, it was a Moroccan lady. Mm-hmm. And she said she, they did it to her mm-hmm. too. And she said her mother, her parents, they believed that because like they did come from another country. So they were not mm-hmm. maybe that comfortable. So they indeed saw the teacher as an authority figure. But for us, like I said, yeah. we are different because like we are Surinamese. We are like, you know, people like we speak Dutch. We speak Dutch because of all <laughs> the things that you did. You forbade yeah. us and you speak our own language. So, mm-hmm. but yeah. It, it happens to a lot, and I think that's uh, yeah, it, it is formative because like it's like I saw it happen there, but now that I'm in the workplace, I still see the same dynamics. You still see people in place uh, that are then responsible for hiring decisions, mm-hmm. <laughs> but they have these very racist views, um, and also like just because I work in the technology field, like the issue of bias, it is an issue there, but we didn't think like okay, why is data bias or where you see that there are bias decisions in the data. Well, that comes from people with this mindset. But these same people are also people that are working in the organizations. So if you want to address the bias, people if people with this mindset are then monitoring the systems or are supposed to be responsible mm-hmm. for mitigating bias, they already know that you still have a problem because also in corporate, I think yeah. corporate, I think out of these same kinds of mindsets. And that's uh yeah, that's some of the realities that we face here. And that's uh yeah, that's when I looked at what I said, how I look back upon my past. Like, I said, even though I was, I was born and raised here, like when I see how society develops, we need to be real also with it's like how, where we are right now. Uh, you also know, like we just had the Dutch election, which had a very interesting uh, result. <laughs> um, and- Come on, be real, Michael. We have an interesting, is that the best that you can do? Interesting? <laughs> no, 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 I'm just starting. You need, you need to. Okay, okay. I like, give you, you, I you give you the runway. I'll give you the runway. <laughs> so we need, we had a very interesting result. And now we need to have a, mm-hmm. a party that is now the by far biggest party in the Netherlands, uh, which has been openly racist in the past, openly anti-Muslims. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is then now mm-hmm. the biggest party. Um, but at the same time, like I am not surprised to see them getting such a high percentage because when I look, like we just look at the stories that also share. Like I am very much aware of the fact that racism is very much a part of Dutch society, and the way that I see, like mm-hmm. it is so so normalized here, it just has become a part of the culture. So people they do racist stuff as if it's a normal thing, and then when you address them, they are like, no, no, it's not racist. Well, it's actually it's very much racist, but it's so normal to them that they act as if it's second nature. So that's why I'm not even though I was of course not pleased with the results at the same time like i have always been very much aware of the country that i'm living in and how people view mm-hmm. people that look like me but also people that look differently that have a different religion 
Um, so yeah, for me, it's like, uh, it is very bad, unpleasant for Saul, but for me, it's like, yeah, I, I know I've been knowing the stories that I just shared with you already show that I'm not aware of what it's really like to do, to grow up here and to live here. And also things like, because I like, I shared stories of when I was a little kid, but when I think, look, I, I've also my mother here in the Netherlands. She's an elderly person now in the 80s. Uh, but just a few years ago, she was wa walking uh, uh, outside. She was uh, uh, at the market here in Amsterdam, in the heart of the city. And then two people passed her. And they called her a monkey. And that happened just a few wow. years ago. And the thing is, like, my mother, she also told me, like, she was shocked because she said, like, it was a long time ago since she experienced that forms of blatant and overt racism, uh, because like maybe 30 years ago or so, that was maybe the last time that she had some, experienced something like that. But this was just a few mm -hmm. years ago that she experienced that. And that was in the marketplace. And sometimes people say like, oh, only uh, the uneducated or people do that, or maybe it's just young little kids. But she said like, it was a, a man and a woman, uh, young adults, no little kids. So they were, they were adults, full grown adults, very well dressed. Uh, so they were not crazy people or whatever, but they walked past her and they said that. And she, my mother said there was also another person there uh, who had seen and heard what happened. And that person said to my mother, please don't say anything to them. You see, that person was afraid that maybe they would do something to her. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the Netherlands right now. So that is not Netherlands long ago. This is just a few years ago. And that's in how they treat an elderly person. And I think these examples are very really important sorry. to share. Like, yeah. Yeah. The I'm sorry that your mother was Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's a shocking thing, like, and that's also that it really pissed me off also when it happened. But that then really also shows, like, mm -hmm. when it comes to that race, like, they don't really care. So you see an elderly person. This is how you treat an elderly person. I was four or five years old in kindergarten. That's how, how you look at me. That's how you want to treat me. So all those fantasies that they float around about, like, <laughs> why they treat people a certain way, it's like, nah, it has nothing to do with that. Because if you treat the elderly like that, if you treat the very young people like that, that again shows like that you have the problem. Like the Tony Morrison quote says, like if you only can feel tall, like you're bringing other people down, that means that you have a serious problem. And the people that do this really have a serious problem. And that's something that I very much see here in the Netherlands that people refuse to acknowledge. And as a result, because they refuse to acknowledge it, you just keep growing and pestering. You yeah. have toxic yeah. workplace. Um, so yeah, I could go on and on about these things, but I just want to give a few examples to give a bit of the, the flavor of the experiences that I have had, but also or the family members have had um, that really show like how yeah, how toxic it actually is to grow up here. So also when yeah. it comes to the question like, okay, where are your roots? Where do you feel rooted? That's why I say like, I'm born and raised here, but that really doesn't mean that, mean that I feel rooted here because the experiences that I've mm -hmm. had, they are, they have not been a, <laughs> a lot of toxic experiences I've had here. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. And it also brings me to the next question because given what you shared about your mom uh, right now, what is it that you want people to take away with them to the present and why? Yeah, I think uh, I th what important, I think, really is also here that things that happened in the past, they, they are not that long ago, actually, for mm -hmm. instance. Yeah. Well, because my family is from Suriname, like, of course, that the whole transatlantic, they call it slave trade, but that word is a euphemism, again, to protect the sentimentalities mm -hmm. of Europeans, because it was human trafficking. Yeah. Uh, the people were yeah. not slaves. It was not the trade. It was human trafficking. So we need to be real about that mm -hmm. also. Um, but the thing is, when people say it was long ago, it was, it was not long ago. In fact, it might have started long ago, but it did not end that long ago. But also, exactly. um, people forget simple things like, for instance, like people can have children when they are 20, but people can also have children when they are 40, songs when they are mid 40s. And why I say mm -hmm. this is because in my family, for three generations in a row, the gap between generations has been around 40 years. And what that means for me personally is I only need to go back three generations, yep. only three generations, and my family is back in slavery. Yep. So I have a picture in my house of my uh, my uh, great-grandmother, like my mother's maternal grandmother. 
three generations ago. I have a picture. I can look at her every day. And she was born in slavery. She was born on the plantation. So when people talk about this long ago, no, it's not long ago. It's very much part of this because my own mother, she was also raised by her grandmother also. Uh, and that's a person that was born in slavery. So like, no, it's not long ago. It's not long ago for us, the, the people that were subjected to that enslavement, but it's also not long ago for the people who did that. So these white Dutch, they also mm -hmm. need to recognize that the reason that they, it, like the brutality that they visited upon other people, that is very much also part of them. Because like, just like for me, it's not long ago, it's also on their side as long ago. And that also explains why they behave in a certain way, why I had this experience trace in kindergarten and in high school and in corporate, what they did to my mother when she was more, you know, walking outside on the marketplace. That is very much to do with mm -hmm. the fact that also for them was not long ago and they did not never deal with that brutality because like you cannot visit this amount of violence on people and think that that's not going to change you as people, not going to change you as a society. So I think that's very important for people to, to realize now, like it's not long ago. And like, if you do not address these things, it is going to mess up your society and keep messing up your society. And it is not a black problem or a brown problem. Like it was done to us by white people. So you must realize it is their problem. And that behavior mm -hmm. they have shown that is not healthy behavior. And they really need to stop with all the gaslighting also. Because like, even though like I, I yeah, I'm from Suriname, but like I said, I'm pan African. I know the history. It's sometimes also like when it comes to gaslighting, you get discussions like, oh, slavery ended long ago. But I'm like, okay, what did you do after slavery? Slavery ended mm. in Suriname. Slavery ended in yeah. But what did you do in Africa then? You divided all of Africa yeah. up. I tell them all the time, like, what did you yeah. do in the Congo? Between 1885 and 1908, in 23 years, historians estimate that 10 to 15 million people were killed by the Belgians in Leopold and his soldiers. Like, who does that? 10 to 15 million people you kill. Um, and then you want to talk to me about slavery has ended. I'm like, yeah, okay, this is what you did in Africa after the slavery was almost abolished. So, and there's a lot of history that you don't get taught in school because the children in Belgium, they did not get this taught in school, even though the Belgians did this in the Congo. We in the Dells, we also don't get this taught in school. We, we get everything about Exactly, we things. don't get it. We, exactly. We only get slaves. We get trading, like we traded people for elements, for gold or for... Yep. For uh, for resources, and that's not the case. Exactly, exactly. So that is, and that's how like history, like how the education system and the media are used to, mm -hmm. yeah, program us in a certain way. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's it's very deliberate. Like you have the the author uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie uh, in a speech, yeah. he said like that how Europe has developed a way of telling the story of its history that he does not aim to basically. Uh, say that that it never happened, but it's the way mm -hmm. of telling the story that basically aims to erase the history as if it had never happened. Mm -hmm. And if that yeah. is how you're programmed, then, okay, then you look at the things that there are right now, you say like, okay, no, these people are so bad. Why are they behaving this way? But like, no, there's a whole history behind that. And the same, you also see things like now in the news, there's a lot about Palestine, for instance, but I've also been aware yeah. about Palestine history for a long time. It did not just happen, it came to be the way that it is right now. Like there's a long history there. That's very much tied to colonialism, uh, but that's also something that they don't teach us in school again, because also Palestine has a very, it, it, it's, it's a, a prime example of colonialism, what has gone down mm -hmm. there. So also there, it's like, yeah, if you don't know the history, yeah, then it's easy to like say shit and stuff, but I'm like, nah, history very much informs why things are the way that they are today. Uh, and you cannot be selective in your history also. Say like, oh, I'm only going to tell this history of those people, or only this part of the history, because like, what Chimamanda also again says, like, if you only tell part of history or part of the story, that's essentially telling a lie. Like, a story is only true. And that, is, and that is what's happening with, that's also what's happening with all these wars, right? Because you mentioned Palestine, yeah. uh, but then again, you have the the wars in Africa, in Sudan, in Congo, which nobody talks about or a few people are talking about. And then, of yeah. course, the Ukrainian war and the Russia war, where certain elements of the whole stories are not being shared. There is a lot more that we are not being shared. And I do want to challenge people to think about the other side of the story, because every country that is at war is losing people, no matter what yeah. your stance is. I don't believe in dehumanizing people, no matter what your stance is. And now nowadays, there is a lot more human dehumanization happening where I'm wondering 
is it needed to to kill the other person or to murder innocent people no matter where they are just because something has done done upon you exactly exactly and that, that's it's like like why do you need to use that violence because like that it really does not make sense and also like when you look at the history like because I'm actually like it is like the Europeans, okay, they went to Africa, they went to South America, they went to Australia. Mm-hmm. Every way yeah. they got garnish, always. And it was like, it yeah. was killing, it was raping of people, etc. Like, why do you do that? But when you look at the history of Europe itself, within Europe, before they left, they, they, they were always was there. They were always killing each other all the time. And that violence, then they then exported and they're like, okay, let's do it on people that don't look like us. Um, but it, mm-hmm. like, why do you do that? Like, why, why do you have that need? Like, even if you disagree with people or you don't like certain things, like why do you feel like that you not only that you need to do that, but that you feel like you have the right to do that? Because also it's that mm. people not only see people doing that, it's like when you look at the whole Palestine situation, but also the situation in the Congo, for instance, it is clear that a lot of mm-hmm. people believe that they have the right to mistreat people. Because Congo, yeah. I've posted with Congo also, like Congo is still being exploited, but it's that's being exploited mm-hmm. for big tech companies is being exploited for the West because now the West might use, put someone in the middle, uh, basically to do the dirty work mm-hmm. for them. But why do they find that? Okay, because they're like, okay, we want to have a certain standard of living here in the West, in Europe, in America, and uh, we don't really care what happens there. But like, if little children are dying in the Congo right now, uh, if they were little white children with uh, those blonde, uh, blonde hair and blue eyes, uh, then the reaction would be very different because you mentioned the Ukraine mm-hmm. war. Uh, between Russia, I remember when that broke when that broke out. Like you heard people saying, "Like, oh my God, we have people that look like us." Or there's a war now in our Europe, and I'm like, mm-hmm. "Yeah, in your Europe, yeah, yeah, people that look like you." One journalist said, "Like, yeah, they look like us, blonde hair, blue eyes," which was ridiculous because the pe- the man that said that had actually dark hair and dark eyes. But yeah, he saw the blonde hair and the blue eyes, so he was like, "How can they do that? This is terrible." But yeah, mm-hmm. meanwhile, people in Eastern Africa are killing. Let's talk about Afghanistan with when down there. Like it's not normal to say, like, okay, I'm just going to kill. You say you want to, uh, for instance, you want to eradicate a certain evil, and then you're just going to kill 300,000 civilians. And we, we were supposed to act. Yeah. That's a normal thing. No, it, it is not normal behavior. But that's how we are being conditioned in the true the education system and the media to act as if that is normal. But it really is not normal behavior. And that's a second form of dehumanizing because the act of violence is dehumanizing us. But if we then need to tell to ourselves that it is okay, if I need to say to myself, like, no, it's okay that you kill 10 to 15 million Congolese, no problem. Let's pretend as if it doesn't happen, as if it doesn't matter. Then we are again dehumanizing ourselves. So, yeah, that's, uh, it's not good. In many different ways, it's not good. Thank you uh, for talking about this and bringing this on as well, bringing this to the attention of the people. And the last question, what is the message for the future that you want to share that people can use to mitigate current challenges? So when I talk about current challenges, I'm referring to anything that that causes exclusion, whether it's discrimination, whether it's racism, any ism that causes exclusion. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, it's people, you know, we, we, just need to really be honest about the best, but also about the current mm-hmm. challenges. Because like, if you're not honest, if you don't want to acknowledge things, if you don't want to take action to things, well, of course, if you don't acknowledge it, then you definitely won't take action. But then nothing will change. And like people always like, they 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 don't feel honest, they want to be honest, because then they feel attacked, or they feel like they've done something wrong. But I'm like, it's not even about you. Like when, when I tell you something that people mm-hmm. are being harmed, I don't really give a damn about you and how you feel. I'm talking about the person that's being harmed. That harm needs to stop. Mm-hmm. If you get all of your feelings, mm-hmm. that's all you. That's not my concern. Like, I'm not even concerned about my own feelings in these things. Like, yeah, my feelings, they're, they're, they're not very important. Like, when people are being killed, like, I'll say, like, forget about your feelings. I could all say it in different ways, but forget about your feelings. The harm, that's the thing that needs to be addressed. I don't care, like, if you, if, if it wasn't your intention or whatever, when people are being harmed, that needs to be addressed. That needs to be acknowledged and put your own feelings mm-hmm. aside in that moment. Um, stop with the, the gaslighting because that's what I also see a lot also in corporate, like harm is being done. People try to address it and then they're being gassed and say like, oh, I can't remember that. Uh, are you sure that's what they meant? Uh, no, you're just being too sensitive or, you know, those kinds of things. I'm like, yeah, that's just people that don't try to want to acknowledge it. And that's on a micro level within corporate, but that's 
It's the same thing that we can see on a macro level in these big global conflicts that we see going on. So I'm like, um, with your own, yeah, like I said, with your own feelings, with your own sensitivities, because I'm like, yeah, you being uncomfortable, that is not as bad as people being harmed on a daily basis, for instance, mm -hmm. being harmed for the whole sure. of lifetime. So I'm like, yeah, you need to be able to like really uh, sit with that. And I think also important to recognize that a lot of that, what we consider normal in society, um, mm -hmm. it is it is normalized, but that something is normalized does not mean that it is normal or natural. Uh, a mm -hmm. lot of what we see in, for instance, in corporate culture, that's actually based on what in anti-racism literature is referred to as the characteristics of white supremacy culture. Um, mm -hmm. I have a friend, uh, Ashini. She talks a lot about uh, these characteristics of white supremacy culture. And that is really very toxic because elements of that include indeed the right uh, to comfort. So people feel that they have mm. the right to be comfortable regardless of what else is going on. Like, no, you, and that, that means like you cannot address anything that is being harmful because like that makes you uncomfortable. That's a part of white supremacy culture. Another thing is either or thinking. It is either this or that. People are either good or bad or whatever. Uh, there is no middle ground. That's a very binary way of thinking. That's also part of white supremacy culture. Um, there's only one right way <laughs> of doing things. Uh, that And that's like, that's why you see like, okay, what the way that we, our society set up, the way that corporations are set up, that's actually very much reflect, that's why I talk about corporate plantation, very much a reflection of the toxicity that started hundreds of years ago, but now it has mm -hmm. been codified into the way that yeah. Uh, yeah, businesses operate, the way that governments also operate, but it's actually not a healthy way of operating. So I think that is important for people to, to also like recognize that. Um, also, please, when you look at um, the whole mindset that you see, like uh, that progress, that progress always means that things need to be bigger and faster, et cetera. But that's also part of white supremacy policy, that that's the, the way that you need to go. And if this is one way that you see that is, like I say, I work in data and AI. Um, and for, you know me, like I've always been talking about the ethical aspects of it, like uh, how certain people are being harmed by technology and can be harmed by technology. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But a lot of folks, uh, they chose to ignore that because it wasn't hurting them because they are from the majority group. But what you've seen this year, this has been interesting, there's been a lot of talk within the AI field about so-called existential threats. Uh, but mm -hmm. the interesting thing is, the people that are concerned about existential threat, I could start to short what they mean with that, is that saying like, okay, what if an artificial intelligence becomes so smart that they are uh, smarter than humans, that they might try to replace us, they may, might try to attack us or whatever, but that's some future science fiction thing. They're talking about AI that is not here yet. We don't even know if it mm -hmm. ever will be there. But say that it would be there. The same people that are saying that, they are not really addressing the harm that's being done right now by the technology. They're not even yeah. asking for regulation for that. They say like, yeah, give us regulation for what might happen in the future. But then I'm like, okay, just let's just be real. Like if someone is really that concerned that this technology might wipe humanity out, then why are you continuing? Because the same people that are supposed to be saying that, they are they're going hard. Like uh, progress is bigger, better, faster. Like they ain't stopping. They just moved along. And I'm like, that already tells you a lot. Like if you're very, really that concerned, then you would just stop. If I would be that concerned about the technology, I would say like, hey, let's stop with the thing. <laughs> it's as dangerous. Mm -hmm. But they're not doing that. And then you can see like, okay, that's again, and that's also again a part of white supremacy culture. Like they are only concerned about um, a thing when it threatens their existence. So they mm -hmm. frame it like that. Like Malcolm X also once said like, yeah, it, there's basically, there's a futility in trying to appeal to the moral uh, consciousness of people that have shown through their actions consistently that they don't have moral consciousness because like they do not change an evil because it's evil or because it's amoral. They only change it when it threatens their existence. And that's exactly, and that's what, again, where I see like how the history and society stuff that I like really intersects with technology. That's exactly what you see now, because that's exactly the language that they use. They talk about existential threats. They frame it in such a manner, matter, and that's when people say, like, in the majority, that white majority, they are like, oh, wait a minute. Now it might be threatening us. It might be in the future threatening yeah. to us directly. Mm -hmm. Forget about the others, but now that it threatens us, now we are concerned, so let's regulate that. 
but still not very concerned about all the other threats that are now being visited upon black people, brown people. So, yeah, I think that's an important thing to recognize that this this reality that we are operating in, it actually is really a white supremacist culture <laughs> setup that we're operating in. It's a continued colonial reality that we're operating in. And that's why I also refer to the corporate plantation. It's very much those dynamics. And uh, like I said, I'm just real about these things because like, also like if you if you know these things, if you see these things, you can also not unsee them. Uh, yeah. Sure. People somebody might choose to look the other way, but I'm not choosing to look the other way because like this is very harmful behavior. And like, like I said in examples that I've shown, like if this is how you look at little children, if this is how you think that you can just treat elderly people walking the streets, that really shows that there's something very much not good in your society. And if you don't want to acknowledge that, then you're never going to change that. So I'm like, really acknowledge what is going on. And like, it doesn't matter even like that certain things, of course, it matters, but it, it doesn't matter in the sense like there are a lot of bad things and that's that's just reality, but that doesn't mean that it needs to stay bad. It also doesn't mean that you are a bad person, but if you try to work on that, you can just yeah actually show to the rest of the world that, okay, I have the ability to grow. That's actually a good thing to do. But why that's also, again, also very difficult to do within that white supremacy culture is that, that one of the features in there is also perfectionism. So perfectionism that means mm-hmm. it needs to be perfect. So that also means like, yeah, no one should be able to tell to you, uh, say to you that you are doing something wrong because you are supposed to be perfect. You cannot be wrong, but that then also hinders growth because if 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 you if you cannot be wrong, that then also means you cannot grow. You cannot develop because you're already at the top. And the reality is, we the yeah the side that we live in is not at the top. There's a lot of toxicity, a lot of harmful stuff there. But the the whole setup of that white supremacy culture then also that hinders basically uh, the ability to grow, the ability to self reflect. So. Yeah, those are some things that I, that I would like to, uh, yeah, give to people to to keep in mind that um, so much of what you what we consider normal, how we have been conditioned right from the start that we are born and raised in these societies, it actually is not norm- normal. We are being, yeah, basically uh, raised into toxic systems, and we need to recognize that, in so that we can stop perpetuating that. I am glad that you mentioned uh, elements of what you shared right now. It, yeah, you made it hard for me to be a host in, in this conversation because I was listening. I was really listening, but you mentioned you dropped a lot of um, a lot of golden nuggets that I hope that people can walk away with at least with one of the golden nuggets. So thank you, Michael, for this conversation it was a pleasure having you for this episode of cooking back to our roots and i hope that people walk away with a lot of tangible golden nuggets thank you i'm glad to hear it and uh yeah also really enjoyed uh, talking to you again so uh, last time mm-hmm. was two and a half years ago already so it was nice to uh, have yeah. you catch up in this form <laughs> <laughs> thank you Thanks for listening to this episode of Cooking Back to Our Roots. I hope you enjoyed my month's conversation with the guest speakers. If you love what you heard today, don't forget to share this episode with your friends and family. Until next time, bye!